Today we will learn and reflect on the history of the Peloponnesian Wars. Why study the Peloponnesian Wars? One main reason is this, you cannot understand the Platonic Dialogues without first understanding the history of the Peloponnesian Wars, because so many of the leading figures of this period are referenced in the Platonic Dialogues, and we can learn many moral lessons from the war which changed the Greek city-states forever. These wars pitted Sparta, Corinth, and her allies against Athens and her sometimes unwilling allies in the Delian League, which was originally formed as a defensive league against Persian encroachment. These wars were in roughly two stages, lasting over three decades. Many historians say they are the world wars of the ancient world. The history of the war includes many interesting personalities, including Pericles, the founder of the radical democracy of Athens, who died in the first years of the war, and Alcibiades, the ladies' man and charismatic personality who was the leader of all three sides of the antagonists of the war. And we have the Spartan commander Lysander, who spared Athens from destruction when she lost the war. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources used for this video. Please feel free to follow along in our PowerPoint script posted to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. The root causes of the Peloponnesian Wars originated in the politics after the Greco-Persian Wars, in which the underdog Greeks defeated the mighty Persian Empire. Although this could not have been predicted at the time, the Greek forces won due to excellent generalship, bravery and persistence, and the excellence of the Greek infantry hoplite formations, the excellence of the Athenian navy, along with good fortune or luck, or as the Greeks would say, the favor of the gods. The main source for the Greco-Persian Wars is Herodotus, father of history, but according to some scholars, the father of lies, or at least the father of tall tales. But an excellent secondary source is Aeschylus' play of the Persians, which was likely an eyewitness account of the Athenian naval battle of Salamis, which was one of the two battles that won the war for Greece. Plutarch also has an excellent life of Themistocles, whose wily and deceptive tactics compelled the Greeks to victory in the naval battle of Salamis. The Peloponnesian Wars followed the Greco-Persian Wars by about 50 years, or as Thucydides describes it, the Penacontatia. In addition to Thucydides, the other major source is Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks, Aristides and Cimon. These two Athenian generals were asked by the Greek colonies of Ionia on and near the western shores of Asia Minor, today Turkey, to organize and lead the defense of Delian League against Persia because the Ionians were wary of the bullying ways of the Spartan general Pausanias. The Delian League evolved into the Athenian Empire, which was the ancient equivalent of the British Empire. Many victories were won against the Persian Empire, and some colonies questioned whether they needed to continue paying tribute to the Delian League, since Persia had been defeated. Under the Athenian leader Pericles, this league developed into a politically oppressive Athenian Empire, although many Athenian allies benefited commercially from the expanded trade opportunities. Pericles was the general and statesman of Athens before and at the start of the Peloponnesian Wars. The decades between these wars saw the rise of Pericles and the reforms leading to the radical democracy of Athens before the start of the Peloponnesian Wars. In these years, the mandatory tribute paid by the allies of Athens funded the massive building program of Athens on the Acropolis, including the Parthenon, which tourists admire up to the present day. Sparta and her allies became concerned and suspicious as the Athenian Empire grew in power and influence, and conflict was inevitable. Although the Cold War historians distorted their interpretation of these wars by comparing Athens to America and Sparta to Russia, this interpretation was problematic. Since all Greek city-states had popular assemblies, they were more alike than they were different. The difference was that the Spartan assembly was dominated by aristocrats, while the common citizens and trireme rowers dominated the Athenian assembly. Ideology did play a role. Sparta encouraged her allies to adopt an aristocratic government, while the Athenians encouraged her allies to adopt a radical democracy with broader representation. Plutarch writes that the Spartans invaded Attica, laying waste to the land. They assumed that the Athenians would not let them get away with this, but would be prompted by anger and pride to fight them. But the idea that they should join battle in defense of their city with 60,000 Peloponnesian hoplites struck Pericles as outrageous. 
he proceeded to pacify those who were spoiling for a fight and were upset by what was happening, arguing that the trees soon grow again even when they've been hacked and chopped. He's referring to the olive trees. Why was Pericles successful in selling the citizens of Athens on the strategy that when the Spartans raid Attica, the Athenians retreat behind their walls, with the city providing them grain shipped in through their ports, watching helplessly as the Spartans torch their fields and smash their houses year after year after year? Indeed, many Athenians were itching to put on the hoplite armor and confront the Spartans, and they had defeated the Spartans in prior hoplite engagements. And after all, it was the Athenian hoplites that routed the Persian infantry in the Battle of Marathon. When the Spartans invaded Attica, although the Athenian hoplites didn't face them in direct combat, the Athenian cavalry did harass them. While the Spartans ravaged the Athenian countryside, the Athenian hoplites simply marched between the long walls that connected Athens to its ports and boarded triremes to ravage the Peloponnese lands near the coast and harassed the shipping and the navies of Corinth and the other Spartan allies. Now, many historians do agree with Thucydides that Pericles was a strategic genius and that the one reason why his successors lost the Peloponnesian Wars is that they strayed from his strategy. But some modern historians speculate that this strategy, by increasing the brutality of the fighting and the suffering of ordinary citizens, actually lengthened the war because it hardened hatreds and ensuring that there would be opposition to any attempts to settle their differences diplomatically, seeking peace. Pericles was a skilled orator, and Thucydides' rendering of his funeral oration has often been compared by scholars to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in the American Civil War. And we also compare these speeches to Churchill's speech honoring those RAF airmen who fought the Luftwaffe bombers in the Battle of Britain, which prevented the invasion of England by Hitler in the beginning of World War II. And who can forget the stirring words? Never before in history have so many owed so much to so few. And the core of this famous ancient oration was no doubt delivered by Pericles, but how much is elaboration by the historian Thucydides we will never know as he himself admits that many of the speeches in his history include what the orator must have said. And Pericles died of the plague in the second year of the Arcadamian War, which is the first phase of the Peloponnesian Wars. Both Sparta and Athens tired of the constant warfare, and the Athenians had captured Spartan hoplites in an engagement who were members of the leading families of Sparta, so Sparta was eager for an exchange of prisoners of war. After the leaders who were eager to continue the war, the demagogue Cleon of Athens and the general Brasidas of Sparta both died in the Battle of Amphipolis. The Athenian general Nicias was able to negotiate a peace that held for six years between Athens and Sparta, called the Peace of Nicias. This was a fragile peace where low-level hostilities continued, particularly by the Spartan allies. The up-and-coming relative of Pericles, Alcibiades, was jealous of Nicias, and this clouded his judgment and hastened the restarting of the wars. The comic Aristophanes performed an anti-war play, Peace, on the Peace of Nicias, showing that this peace had popular support in Athens. And we also pondered whether Pericles started the war needlessly. The Peace of Nicias was broken when the up-and-coming Alcibiades, who was raised in the household of Pericles, agitated for Athens to send out a large portion of its triremes, plus thousands of hoplites, in the doomed Sicilian expedition and the talented general Alcibiades was indicted on trumped-up charges and went into exile in Sparta when his conviction appeared certain. When the Syracusans defeated the dilatory and timid Nicias, the other general of the expedition, the Athenians lost everything. Triremes, hoplites, rowers, even generals, including Nicias. And they were all destroyed and slain. Very few escaped, and Sparta restarted the war in response to Athenian aggression and taking advantage of her loss in Sicily. And this led to the eventual defeat of Athens in these wars many years later. Thucydides is concerned with the moral lessons that can be learned from history. Three battles from this period of the history of the war stand out. In the revolt of Mytilene, in the early years of these wars, the Athenians voted for harsh measures, calling for the men to be slaughtered and the women and children to be enslaved. But calmer tempers prevailed, and the next day the assembly reversed its position. The more merciful message was dispatched on a trireme where the men rode throughout the night, eating the meals on the boat rather than on the beach, and reached Mytilene in the nick of time to save the inhabitants. In the Revolution of Corsair, we are reminded that war often brings simmering conflicts to the surface, and during these conflicts there were several civil wars between the aristocrats and the ancient equivalent of the middle classes. After the Melian Dialogue and the latter years of these wars, the Athenians voted for harsh measures, 
but due to the moral decay during the course of these long wars, the men in Milos were slaughtered, and the women and children were enslaved. But when Athens lost the war, they were chewing their nails, hoping that the Melian outrage would not be held against them by the victorious Spartans. And in the ancient world, the brutality of a conquering hostile state massacring military-aged men and enslaving the women and children was all too common. This and piracy was a source of slaves in the ancient world. This was the fate of Troy when she was conquered by the Greeks in the Trojans' Wars. After the disastrous Sicilian expedition, Athens slowly recovered over the next few years, although many of her allies rebelled. What happened to Alcibiades after he fled the Athenian fleet to avoid facing a hostile jury in Athens on trumped-up charges? Alcibiades stalked his way into the good graces of the Spartans in speeches at their assembly, became the pro-typical Spartan, exercising like a Spartan, and eating the coarse Spartan gruel, and offering valuable military advice that helped Sparta gain the edge in the war. But Alcibiades being Alcibiades, he could not resist sleeping with the king's wife. After she gave birth to their son, the outrageous Alcibiades then fled to the court of the Persian satrap, Tissaphernes, who was allied with Sparta. He advised Tissaphernes so that he should not decisively support either Athens or Sparta, but keep them evenly matched so they could wear each other out, so Persia could then swoop in and take over. But he was not done with his double dealing. Alcibiades maneuvered to be reappointed as general of the Athenian forces, who were camped out near the Persians, and likely could have won the war for Athens if the Athenian assembly were not so judgmental and hypocritical of his efforts and his mistakes. Which means that Alcibiades first led the Athenians until they indicted him on trumped-up charges, then he was an advisor to the Spartan king until he slept with his wife, then he was an advisor to the Persian satrap, until he managed to be elected as maritime general for the Athenian fleet at the island of Samos. So how did he manage that? You need to listen to the longer videos for more clues. Alcibiades continues to amaze historians. And you can see from the painting that Alcibiades was a favored student of Socrates. And Alcibiades was close to Socrates, Plutarch comments. The fact that Socrates was in love with him strongly suggests that the boy was endowed with a natural aptitude for virtue. Socrates saw Alcibiades' good looks as the brilliant external manifestation of this excellence. And Alcibiades did have a remarkable run of victory over Sparta and her allies for five victorious years. But after a minor tactical defeat, Alcibiades was deprived of his command for the second time, and he chose to go into exile once again. The Athenians continued to be victorious, but sometimes afterwards the Athenian generals won a great victory in the Battle of Argonuse. But in the chaos of battle, they failed to expeditiously rescue many Athenian rowers who were clinging to the wreckage of their triremes. Suddenly a fierce storm arose, and not only were the men drowned, but their bodies were swept out to sea and were not recovered. This was traumatic to the Athenians, for they believed that if you were not properly buried, when you died, your soul would never come to rest in the underworld, but would forever wander the earth as a forlorn ghost. Acting in haste, the Athenian assembly executed six of the ten generals for failing to save these rowers or recover their bodies, even though they'd won a great victory. These proceedings were illegal because the generals were tried simultaneously by the assembly, not in individual jury trials, and were denied sufficient time to defend themselves. The inexperienced generals replacing them lost the war to the Spartan general Lysander when their carelessness permitted the enemy to destroy the Athenian fleet of 200 triremes on the beaches. Ironically, Alcibiades' castle was not too far from the Athenian fleet, and he tried to warn the generals that the fleet was exposed and that they should move to a more protected harbor, but they ignored his advice. Now, Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian Wars halted mid-chapter, mid-sentence, and was resumed by Xenophon's History of Our Times. In Plutarch's Life of Lysander, Xenophon explores why Lysander and the Spartans showed mercy on Athens when she lost the Peloponnesian Wars. Xenophon tells us the worries of the Athenians. As news of the disaster was told, one man passed it on to another, and a sound of wailing arose, first from the Piraeus, the port of Athens, and then all along the long walls until it reached the city. That night no one slept. They mourned for the lost, but still more for their own fate. They thought that they themselves would now be dealt with as they had dealt with others, with the Melians, colonists of Sparta, after they had besieged and conquered Melos and then list several other atrocities that the Athenians regretted committing. Scholars generally say that the crisis of the Athenian polis happened after the end of the Peloponnesian Wars, when the victorious Spartan Lysander insisted that, as terms of the peace, the Athenians set up an aristocracy under the rule of the Thirty Tyrants. 
Although the previous tyrants in the 6th century BC were benevolent tyrants, the 30 were tyrants of the worst kind, dominated by the vicious Critias, a tyranny that quickly descended into an orgy of bloodshed directed first against their enemies and then against their fellow aristocrats so they could seize their property. This misrule preceded the re-establishment of the radical democracy of Athens and the events of the 30 tyrants cast a long shadow over Athenian history and the Platonic dialogues. Alcibiades and Critias, who was the leader among the Thirty Tyrants, were both students of Socrates, and this fact harmed the reputation of Socrates and contributed to his trial and execution shortly after the democracy was re-established after the Thirty Tyrants were overthrown. The rule of the Thirty Tyrants devolved into a civil war. Both Plato's and Xenophon's Symposium have guests who were part of the tyranny and guests who were victims of the tyranny of the Thirty Tyrants. The Platonic Dialogues were written soon after the Peloponnesian Wars. Now, our first video of the symposium includes the discussion on romantic love, and in the second video, Socrates tells us what the entrancing Diotima taught him about divine love. Plato's symposium ends with Alcibiades crashing the party as a living example of romantic lust that is not divine, as he tells the guests how Socrates declined his advances, and how much he respects and admires Socrates for his higher moral values and higher love. So how did the Peloponnesian Wars affect Athens? And the most drastic consequence of the wars on Athens was the casualty rates. The total casualty rates must have exceeded 50% of the Athenian hoplites and rowers, and civilian casualties were also high. After the war, Athens must have been a city mostly populated by widows and orphans. Historians don't often discuss the effects of these massive casualties that easily dwarf the American casualties of the Civil War as a percentage of the population, and probably even exceeded the Russian and German casualties of World War II. We can estimate the casualties best for Athens. In addition to the casualties of heavy fighting, we can estimate that a quarter of the population was wiped out in the plague, including the soldiers. Maybe another quarter of the soldiers in the population expired in the doomed Sicilian expedition. Maybe another quarter were slaughtered when Lysander captured the Athenian fleet due to their carelessness, plus those whom the Thirty Tyrants executed afterwards. And the perpetual large-scale wars did not end. The peace once again simmers for a decade, but then the Corinthian War and then the Boeotian Wars erupt. The account of these wars dominates Xenophon's Hellenica, History of My Times, that begins by documenting the end of the Peloponnesian Wars and the Thirty Tyrants. Though perhaps not as destructive as the Peloponnesian Wars, large-scale wars are waged for another three decades. Sparta is eventually defeated by Thebes, who frees her Mycenaean Helot slave populations. These perpetual wars left all Greek city-states in a weakened state, vulnerable to take over by the expansionist Macedonia under King Philip and his son Alexander the Great in a later generation. And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. The ancient historian we rely on in the history of the Greco-Persian Wars is Herodotus, and in the next generation the Athenian general Thucydides, who became historian after the Athenian assembly voted to exile him after military defeat which was likely not justified. Although Thucydides lived through the war, his account drops off in mid-paragraph and mid-sentence soon after the oligarchic coup, when Alcibiades was recalled as general, and Xenophon literally begins his history after those events. Xenophon was known in antiquity as an historian, a general, and a philosopher, a moral philosopher in the Stoic mold, who is highly regarded by both ancient and medieval scholars, although he is deprecated by many modern scholars, but not by this channel. And the Roman historian Plutarch, in his Lives of Noble Greeks and Romans, writing four centuries later, is a valued source, as he consulted many sources that have been lost in the sands of history, and we also consulted the modern history of Will Durant. And let's not forget the Iliad that we mentioned briefly. Since all our videos on the Peloponnesian Wars use many of the same sources, we have a video on book reviews of ancient Greek history. The YouTube description includes a link to our PowerPoint script that we uploaded to SlideShare and also our blog. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. Plus, you can click on the meetup or small M icon to participate in our online discussions where we practice our future YouTube scripts. And please click on the links for other videos that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul.